Good morning, sir. Perfect, we're gonna give it one more minute and we'll get started. And then Ada, you said uh, you will be presenting, correct? So are you the only yeah, one that the co -hosting? I'll do the slide deck. Yeah, okay. yes, good. thank you. First. All right, well, for time's sake, let's, we can get started. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Sarai. I am the Parent University Coordinator for Network 4 at Logandale. Uh, welcome to another face-to-face -face programming. Today, we have coffee, parent trainings. So uh, before we get started today, uh, just some, some quick reminders about our norms. So this session will be recorded. We wanna make sure that we're able to share this information um, with parents who are unable to join us live today. Uh, you can find this session and all other sessions uh, for the face-to-face -face programming and our YouTube channel. And uh, the link is on the screen at the moment and we will also be providing that in the chat. Uh, so we will have a presentation followed by a conversation with Karen Lynn, Dexter, Charlene and Michael. Uh, so the chat will be open for any questions, um, but I, I know that uh, Ada mentioned that there will be some pauses uh, during the presentation to take those questions. Um, but please keep in mind that uh, depending on how we're going on time, we may not be able to get through all the questions, but we will definitely do our best. Uh, please make sure to mute your microphone, be respectful with your comments, be brief when sharing, and please sign up for our newsletter. Uh, we'll make sure to put that link in the chat as well. So please follow us um, for our next sessions. On Tuesday, the 22nd, we have SEL uh, in Spanish. It's a Spanish session. On uh, Wednesday, the 23rd, we have our ODLSS, also a Spanish session. Thursday, the 24th, we have Northstar, a digital literacy program that we're doing in English this month. And then Monday, the 28th, we have um, a nutrition workshop that's gonna be bilingual. Uh, please make sure to join our mailing list and then RSVP for any sessions that you're interested in joining. Uh, that link is in the chat and you can also scan the QR code that's on the screen. Once again, everyone, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Sarai Garcia. I am the Parent University Coordinator of Network 4 and I welcome you to another face-to-face -face programming. Today we have coffee parent trainings. So our presenters today are Karen Lynn, Dexter, Charlene, and Michael. Welcome, thank you so much for being here with us today and providing uh, this amazing information for our parents. And I will uh, pass the mic over to you all for you can uh, introduce yourself. Good morning, my name is Dexter Leggins. I'm from the West Side of Chicago at the West Side Power Pack. Uh, Kofi Power Pack, an organization of over 25 years old. We're a bi biracial organization building relationships between Black and Latin communities. We advocate, we advocate for issues affecting our community and our families and building leadership to develop powership, to develop parent power. Um, I think she, uh, uh, she introduced herself. Uh, we're gonna ask O-S-E-L to introduce themselves. Thanks, Dexter. And I wonder if Ms. Campbell and Lynn can introduce themselves too, and then we can go with uh, Michael from OSCL. Hello, everybody. I'm Charlene Campbell. I'm a parent member of Kofi Power Pack. And I have a, um, I'm a parent of seven children, 
and I, I think I got four or five grandkids. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Karen Lynn Morton. Everybody calls me Lynn, so feel free to call me Lynn. I am founding member and co-chair emeritus of Power Pack and a member of the West Side Branch. Ooh. Good morning, everybody. I'm Mike Aguilar Dale, student discipline support specialist with the Chicago Public Schools Office of Social and Emotional Learning. Very good. We ask all the participants uh, to introduce themselves in the chat and their name and their school. Kofi Power Pack and CPS has been working together to build to bring this training. To bring this training. As Power Packer parents, we want to change the school discipline polit That's right. policy that contributes to criminalization of our children. Other parents also need to know that we are we're all about knowing about school discipline. We're doing this training today to get parents informed about school discipline and school's code of conduct. We are working together with CPS because, because we have been, been to the Office of Social Emotional Learning and the Parent University to understand the vision. We're working towards to help our kids and our schools and our communities and the black and brown communities to fight together rather than fight against each other. This is, the, this is an interactive training. We, are, we encourage you to have your cameras on as much as possible. We want to see you to get to know you. Please keep your microphone muted when you are when when you are not speaking to help reduce the background. Let us know in the chat if you need any support with technology. Use the chat to ask questions. If any questions is left unanswered. At the end of this training, we'll develop a one pager with answering to, spend, to send to you, to you all. The page includes the Power Pack information in case you want to stay connected. With that said, uh, Ms. Charlene. Ms. Charlene, uh, you're on mute. Okay, can y'all hear me now? Yes, perfect. Okay. Hi everybody, I'm Charlene Campbell. I'm from Spur, I'm off the south side, best side. I just wanna ask y'all a question. Now, before I had kids, I was bad to the bone. I was there. I used to go to Whitney Young. So something happened while I was at Whitney Young that I want to ask you all, was there ever a time that you all got in trouble at school or your child got in trouble? What happened? What, what was the outcome? And how did you feel about it? And like I said, when Whitney Young was very first built, I was one of the first graduates out of there. And like I said, I was bad to the bone. I got suspended for wearing slippers through the hallway. There was no student conduct book that I knew about. Nobody had said anything about don't wear slippers. Whitney Young was sparkling clean, carpet was great. You could just, everything was spit shine. So why shouldn't I be able to wear my slippers? They had told me, the first time they mentioned, you shouldn't wear your slippers. Okay, they didn't say I couldn't wear my slippers. So right before they suspended me, they said, if you wear your slippers again, you're going to get suspended. Like I said, I was bad to the bone. I did it again. And I got suspended for a day. Now, I didn't feel that was right. I didn't feel that was proper. Nobody told me anything in writing about you know, this is a policy. I don't even know today if it was the policy. 
So that's just an example of what I'm asking about. If you ever had any problems or situations with yourself, with you yourself getting in trouble at school or your child. So if you, I want you to use the chat. So if you can think of a situation where you are out got in trouble, I want you to put a one in the chat. Now, everybody that puts a one, think about it, because I had to think way back, way back yonder to Whitney, y'all. For everybody that put a one, I want you to think about the accomplishment that came out of that situation and then put a two if you thought it was unfair. So whatever situation you're talking about, whether it was you or your child, whatever the, the punishment or consequence was, if you didn't think it was right, put a two. Now for that same situation, if everybody that's thinking about this, if you thought the consequence was appropriate, that you thought it was fair, put a three. Now, while you're thinking about that, is there anybody that would like to talk about their situation or whatever might have occurred? So you mean to tell me all y'all was good in school and y'all never got in trouble? Lord have mercy. I like well, to talk, I know how to talk about each other. Okay. Miss Sher, well, I, I had I, well, I know a situation like prior, but it didn't happen to me. It happened to somebody that I knew. Well, I was well, I knew the child, so I was over there and I pretty much kind of um handled everything, but I really didn't understand it. You want to hear the situation? I understand. Okay, so I can speak about that, right? Yeah, you can speak on that. Okay, because it's a school of kind of. Okay, so I didn't, uh, I didn't know if the uh, this was in the um the school of conduct as far as um. You can wear children can't wear gym shoes to school with lights that lights up. Oh. Cause it was a situation where they said that they can't, but I don't remember it being in there. And they made, I knew the little girl and I was trying to like find out cause I don't remember that being in there, but they said that, so they made her take off the shoes. A mm. little girl, her, her new shoes that she, um, you know, she got it for her birthday. And they actually like took the shoes off of her. And I was like, well, hold on, you know, cause I knew one of her relatives where, you know, and they, actually made her put on some shoes from the school that they had without yeah and they said that children can't wear when I talked to the principal about it she said that uh if they wear shoes with lights on it that it can um cause a reaction like to children who have uh seizures or um oh, what's the yeah. other thing yeah or like uh have um oh my god I can't think of the word uh children that you, you can't understand what I'm saying, Miss Charlene. I can't really think of the yeah. word. Yeah. yeah, like like children that's like kind of like diverse, you know, stuff like that. It can cause them to like behave erratically if they uh, wear shoes. Like, but I don't remember being in the school or, um in the you know in the book. So, you know, that's a good point that you made because um, a lot of issues. Just the part about that light flashing can spark someone to have steam. So where that parent thought, oh, I'm just buying my child some nice shoes and this is what she wanted, not realizing that that could inhibit someone else's situation. Now, I, I, I understand that, but I just read in the chat that somebody had put schools can make their own dress code. Did I read that correctly? Yeah, Ms. Charlene, this is Mike from OSCL. Yeah, so it's in the student code of conduct that schools are allowed to set their own dress codes. Um, so something like that is not explicitly explicitly prohibited from the student code of conduct. It's, it's the first time I've ever heard that level of specificity, though. With that reason, I mean, you know, depending on the environment, I could see it. Um, could yeah. cause a problem for certain students, especially if they're in a, a you know, a self-contained classroom. But... Um, the response from the school is, is shocking. That's not something that we would encourage that school to, you know, to do. Yeah, you know, 
go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, yeah, just the, uh, the, the, um, the adult that was kin to the child actually, you know, was working for CPS and was really up. Like, it was like a big thing because the same thing I learned, I did hear. Um, but we were going by the book, you know, and she felt that way too. Like it's not in the school of conduct where they can't wear light up shoes and for them to just take them off of her and put on some more shoes that it was yeah it was just I didn't understand it either but I heard that too that they can make up their own you know whatever they want to do at the school you know just listening to that story we're talking about the 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 language the rules the policies that's in this book but listening to that story that brings me to the diverse learners because how many people we have walking down the street, they may look like strong, healthy, able-bodied people, but they have something else going on inside that you don't see. And so it's not addressed. And then you got people that might bully them or do things to them, not realizing that these children have other things going on. So when we talk about things that's not put in the book I think in general across the board parents humans all of us need to think about the individual what might be going on with that person that we could possibly help the situation or help the person in not making a bad situation worse so with that being said I'm going to pass it on to Lynn and she's going to tell you some more stuff about the book and work we do Lynn, Lynn uh, you're on mute. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, Charlene. Um, <clears throat> and thank you all for uh, being here this morning. We are here in this training um, to talk about the student code of conduct, but we need to first start with some context. Um, <clears throat> the student code of conduct is the name of the book that all CPS schools use to respond to behavior or discipline issues. Now, let me pause right here. Uh, Ms. Jones just gave us a perfect example of something being not explicitly written in the student code of conduct. So this is another area for parents and community folks for us to interact with the school. If there's something going on that's not explicitly written because if everything was written in that student code of conduct, it'd be like uh, the old school Webster's dictionaries. It'd be so thick and heavy that who could carry it? And, um, so this is another area of interaction for um, us to interact with the schools. So it includes every, I'll say it this way, it includes every major thing <laughs> um, that we could think of, that CPS could think of, from running in the halls, uh, horse playing in the halls, skipping class, bullying, fights, and anything that has to do with student behavior. Some background <clears throat> on how this book and the CPS discipline approach has changed over the years which is a great thing. In the early two, 2000s, Power Pack parents first came together to talk about ways our schools were treating our children. And an important part of that conversation was understanding zero tolerance school discipline. Zero tolerance was focused on punishment, negative behavior, and punitive discipline. Punitive discipline equals suspensions, and expulsions and arrest. Zero tolerance criminalized our kids. And this was part of the creation of the school to prison pipeline. It is very real, y'all. It's very real. I lived it. Zero tolerance started in the early 2000s and it was adopted by schools across the country as the go-to practice for school discipline. But the focus was on punishment, negative behavior, followed by harsh disciplinary action. We saw suspensions and expulsions from schools reach peak levels. 
And of course, Black and Latino students were the most targeted in these practices. Zero tolerance lacked compassion and understanding. It told our children that they were bad kids, that they didn't belong, belong in schools, that they were the problem. Zero tolerance criminalized our children and very often drove them straight into the hands of the juvenile justice system. What we want instead in our schools are practices that focus less on punishment and more on creating supportive and healing spaces that help prevent behaviors by addressing the root cause and supporting our students. This can happen in many different ways. And that could be from increasing counseling and therapy um, and social workers. But one of, the, one of the practices that is near and dear to Power Pack is restorative justice. RJ prioritizes relationships putting ourselves in other people's shoes and nurturing deep human connection. Restorative justice is a philosophy, a set of values, upholding the belief that those who experience harm and those who cause harm can work together to repair and strengthen relationships. So we advocate for restorative justice because we know that often what our children need is someone to connect with, someone to listen to them. Yes, counseling and mental health services are extremely important, but all can benefit from feeling connected to community. And RJ facilitates that connection. And you guys, I need, I need to uh, say this. You guys keep hearing me refer to RJ, RJ. You will not hear RJ or restorative justice and look in that student code of conduct is going to say restorative practice so i'm sorry I, I didn't want to confuse you i just it just clicked in my brain that i kept saying rj <laughs> all right so after years of hard work and um advocacy and working with cps to in 2007 zero tolerance was eliminated from the student code of conducts of Chicago public schools. So every year since then, parents and students have worked hard to help CPS move further and further along toward making care, support and prevention a priority over punishment and criminalization. When zero tolerance was eliminated from the student code of conduct, this is when CPS adopted restorative practices. However, we also know that while we have a vision that we are moving toward as a community and as a district, the day-to-day -day in school buildings may play out differently. What an individual student experiences so often depends on the who. Who is the principal? Who is the dean? Who are the other adults responsible for school discipline in the building? That is why we believe it is critical for all CPS parents to be aware and understand the student code of conduct. This book is what your school leaders use when they need to decide disciplinary action. This is what they should be using when they need to decide disciplinary action. But it's also a book parents can reference to ensure that your school leaders are making good decisions when it comes to school discipline. Now we are going to hear from our partners at CPS, Office of Social and Emotional Learning, to share an overview of the code, the structure, the rules, the policies that are particularly important for parents to be aware of. Uh, Michael, is he still on, or did he get disconnected? No, 
I'm here. Okay. All right. So what we have here on the screen now is an image of our 2021-2022 Student Rights and Responsibilities Handbook. Um, so this handbook contains the Student Bill of Rights, um, all the different rights um, that students have and that families have as well. Um, and this booklet also contains the student code of conduct. So there's more in here than just the set of codes and available consequences um, that we have for student behavior. Next slide. <clears throat> so what's the point here of school discipline and what is the goal here of students as they go through the school's discipline process? Um, so the first point here is that we wanna foster safe and supportive school environments for our students. Um, we know students, you know, are, are diverse people, young people, um, and we don't um, expect behavior to always be, you know, perfect and in line with everything, but we want to be trying to promote supportive school environments. And we see um, challenging behaviors as an indicator that um, we have a little bit more work to do. Um, we want to be able to teach students lifelong social and emotional skills. We don't want to just correct behavior that's challenging. We want to be teaching um, replacement behaviors and lifelong skills. Because as, as everybody on this call knows, um, life throws curveballs at you. Sometimes every single day, and there's something that goes on that can be challenging for us to get through. Um, and we have families and bosses and, and responsibilities that we can't just go crazy on. We have to figure out how to keep it in and, and, and get through it. Um, keep it in is probably a, a not a right, the right way to say it, but to get through it. And, we, and it's our responsibility when things aren't going the right in school that we're teaching students how to navigate through that um, for the rest of their, of their life. So um, in addition, we wanna make sure that when something doesn't go right, that we're restoring community. Um, you know, we all exist within larger communities. We wanna make sure that we're store, restoring that community. We're repairing any harm that's been caused both um, to the student because um, sometimes these situations go back and forth and there's more responsibility than just on the students. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're repairing harm in all areas and we're addressing the needs of those who are harmed. What are the people that are harmed need? A lot of times these difficult behaviors we see um, are coming from a place of I was harmed by somebody else and now I'm lashing back out and I wanna harm you back. So how can we address those needs and how can we address the harm that everybody in that situation is feeling, not just the student who is engaging in the behavior. We also want to address what is the root cause of that behavior. Behavior is a symptom of something else, that something else is going on. Um, so we want to address the root cause of behavior. This is one of the reasons that um, we are really taking such a hard look at our suspensions and our exclusionary discipline, because it does not do much at all to address the root cause of a student behavior, to understand the whys behind why a student is behaving the way they are. Um, we want to meet that need. We want to understand that why. We want to support that why and help fill in that gap. Of course, our, our kids are in school not only um, to learn their SEL skills, but also to be taught to learn. Um, and we want to protect instructional time. So we want to make sure that classrooms are, are safe and are not being disrupted. We also want to make sure that those students who are engaging that behavior are getting as much time in the classroom as possible by really trying to limit those exclusionary consequences. Um, I know Lynn talked a lot about fairness and equity. Um, we take a, a really, really hard look all the time at who is getting what consequence and are those consequences and results of behaviors being applied fairly and equitably across the district. Um, we don't want to see, for example, um, large numbers of, of students of color getting suspended for infractions and white students who are getting the same infractions not having the same results. So we want to make sure that things are being done equitably and fairly. And that's always at top of mind for us. Finally, our mission as a district to support, as a, to support our kids for college, career, and civic life. Um, we want to make sure that they are well-rounded young people, that they have the skills and tools that they need to go out and face the world. Next slide. Okay, so what is in it? So I know I, I mentioned a little bit about what's in the handbook. Um, so in the Student Rights and Responsibilities, we have the Student Bill of Rights and Resources around it. We have our bullying and bias-based behavior policy that addresses 
what bullying is, what bias-based behavior is, and how and what rights students and families have around it, and what to expect if they um, if we suspect bullying is happening or an allegation of bullying is made. Um, so who manages and creates this policy? Um, so the chief education officer um, in conjunction with the Office of Social Emotional Learning. So it's us, we have worked extensively with um, Chief McDade when she was here, um, interim um, Chief Sweeney, and now um, Chief Chukomova. Um, so we work hand in hand with the CEDO to make sure that everything is in line. Um, and ultimately, no matter what changes are made, um, the CPS Board of Ed approves all changes. And what they like to see, and which we completely agree, is that a stakeholder review process happens. So getting parents, students, discipline leaders, teachers, principals, assistant principals, all kinds of folks um, from across the district um, are being heard and having an ability, a chance to weigh in. So who implements the policy? Um, so now we know who manages and creates it. So who is in charge of putting it into practice and that's school administrators. So people like principals and assistant principals. And then of course, school deans, discipline leaders or other designees. Um, and of course, the folks impacted by this policy are students and families. So it's really important for us to have students and families at the table when we're making any sort of changes to the student code of conduct. Next slide. So the book is split up into different sections. We've got the intro with rights and responsibilities for everybody. We've got requirements and guidelines. Um, so these are required processes, things like due process, making sure that everybody has the ability um, to know what they're being accused of and having the option, opportunity to respond to that before consequences are decided. Um, it also has suspension guidelines and notifications on police guidelines. For those of you who have been with us for the last year or so, you'll know that we did a pretty significant update and change to our police notification policy this past year. What behaviors are covered by the Student Code of Conduct? We've got six groups. Um, group one, um, is the least disruptive and group all the way up to group six, which is the most disruptive. Um, so then group six, we have things like sexual assault, murder, things like that are in group six. Assault of, of staff or severe injury of students um, are in group six. So each consequence group has available consequences. So it's a menu of disciplinary options. It's not that all of them have to be done or only one can be done. That would be zero tolerance. So we want to make sure that certain behaviors are getting certain responses. Um, and this includes, of course, at every stage, restorative and supportive um, options. Um, and then we get more punitive options and more and longer inclusionary length, the more severe the behavior gets. Um, but at any point, suspension or exclusion is never required. Um, so we want to make sure that if a, if a, if a student can, can have a restorative practice, um, and engage in that kind of skill building, that's always going to be our preference. Next slide. All right, let's talk about due process because I talk about due process constantly with my discipline leaders. It's huge. Um, due process is a protection provided by the 14th Amendment. Um, and essentially, um, this is happening when the students provided the opportunity to respond to allegations of misconduct and share their side of the story. Um, we don't want to say, so I'm, I'm sure folks on the line here have had the experience of the student saying, you know what, you fought, you're getting suspended. That's not how it's supposed to happen. That's a violation of due process. So in simple terms here, due process means we are upholding students' rights as an individual and are acting with fairness. Because we all know that what we see from our perspective may not be the full story in any situation. There's always two sides, sometimes three, four, five sides to a story. We have to hear all those sides out before we determine what a consequence is. Because what we may perceive as what happened once we talk to students may understand that it's something completely different. And we should not be issuing consequences um, for behavior until we have a really full picture of what happened. And that, in a nutshell, is due process. This is an example of, I'm not going to go through all of these, an example of um, group one behaviors, low level things like leaving the classroom without permission, um, having a cell phone when you're not supposed to, um, you know, running in the hallway, making excessive noise in the hallway. 
things like that. Next slide. And then we see here, we can skip forward to group three. We're at group three here. So this is when things starting to get a little bit more disruptive. You'll see here with group three that out of school suspension is now introduced, um, but there's some caveats to it. So out of school suspensions here can only be used um, when school safety is being threatened. Um, but we recommend that the uh, that non-exclusionary -exclus discipline be used first um, before we go the route of exclusionary discipline. And, and especially here with group three, we wanna see that the behavior has happened more than once before we consider putting a student out. So in every group, you will see here on the right side, available interventions and consequences. That is what can be applied to a student's behavior. All right, let's go. Yeah, so now we're up here in the most seriously disruptive behavior, stuff that could be considered illegal. So things like arson, bomb threats, robberies, um, distribution of drugs and alcohol in, in school, um, sex acts or attempted sex acts that are not um, voluntary by both members. So acts of force, sexual force, um, are part of our most serious behaviors. Um, again, you're going to see here we have a pretty big range of available consequences. So everything from um, parent conferences to restorative practices, to district level interventions like the SMART program, um, in-school suspension, and out-of-school suspension. For group sixes too, we also have the option of um, recommending a student for expulsion. So uh, most of what we see in the expulsion committee, which is going on in, in, in actually right now, um, I'm here instead of being there, um, it are group six behaviors. Mostly it's group five and six behaviors. So um, that's what we're seeing as some of the most seriously disruptive things here. But again, it's not required that a student be put out of school, even for a group six behavior. If we can help and we can assign interventions and we can get that student or that student's family what the things that they need to be successful, then that's what we really push schools to do before we are looking at exclusionary discipline. And I'll pass it over to Charlene. Oh, thank you, thank you. I really like that presentation. I like the part about the symptoms and getting to the root cause because it's about our children, but we need to know, you know, as the adults, sometimes we got symptoms and we need to know what our root cause is before we deal with a situation. This whole thing about the student code of conduct is just to give you an introduction, a little smidgen of the book itself because we couldn't go over everything that's in there and really explain it to you. We have come across parents that's never heard of this, don't know it exists, but it's really good and for a parent to know that this document is around and for them to learn and understand it. And the only way that you can do that is to get a copy. And you probably have to go over it and go over it and go over it. You know, I, I've always said, our parents used to tell you, don't let me tell you one more time. But in actual fact, when it comes to children, you do have to say one more time. When you go over this book, you're going to have to go over it one more time to make sure you get the understanding of everything in there. That's the first part. Get a copy and go over it. So out of everything that you've heard today, I hope that you realize that this is a tool that you can use to help you. Even if there's nothing going on with your particular child, you might see something with another child. This book still holds true. Like Patricia said, it wasn't her child, but she knew of something else. The code is for everyone under the roof of that school. It's a tool that you heard some things about the behavior groups and the interventions. And all those things are interpreted by who is handling the situation. Two kids fighting might be real minor, rolling around on the playground and just be a minor situation, which would be a group two. But an administrator might decide, well, I'm going to up it to a group three. But if you don't know the books with the different groups, you might know, might not know. You can appeal that decision. 
So you got to know the book and you got to know your rights. When you appeal in your decision, you can push forth a restorative practices that you want to intervene on your child. But everything has a process, no matter where you at, go through the process. Hopefully you have developed a relationship with the, the child's student. So you have somewhere to start, but then your next level is talk to your principal. Sometimes principals are hard to get to in developing a good relationship, but that's where you start. Know who your chief officer is. Know where they're located. Write these numbers down, addresses, phone numbers, who you talk to, what time you talk to them. Know the central office, the Office of Social and Emotional Learning. Know the people in the office and their phone number extensions, because these are the people that can help you sometime in dealing with a decision. Now, we, we showed you the book. We talked about the stuff in there. And we know sometimes when you walk in the door of the school, it's a, it's a whole different thing. The student code of conduct book is not set in stone. It's a document, a piece of paper with words. Those words have changed. The language has changed. The groups have changed. And it will still change as long as there are people on this earth, Lynn talked about zero tolerance. I don't know if any of you all have children old enough to remember zero tolerance and how that was dealt with. Now we have restorative practice where zero tolerant, tolerance is not tolerated. And there's some places that's still trying to put that down. We talked about suspensions. I don't know if any of your kids are old enough to know. There was a time when kids got suspended for 10 days. There was a time when kindergartners, second graders, all got suspended. Now, what can a kindergarten do to get suspended? And how is their learning if you're not in school? But the, as the document has changed, so has these policies to make sure there's a continuity of trying to get a better understanding with the building, the parents, the kids, and everybody. Now, this was not mentioned, but I do want to say, when we talk about restorative practice, it's everybody in the building, all hands on deck, even the lunch staff, the restorative staff. is supposed to be involved with that restorative practice. So we're not just saying it's involved your child, the teacher, and the principal. If we're pushing for restorative practice, we want everybody to be involved. Involved. We don't want the kindergartners getting suspended. They can be able to talk to the janitor and like, I know you you seen Susie Q pushing me and then the janitor can have a conversation if they have time because they own the time limit. We don't want folks getting suspended unnecessarily. And we want you as the parents to know you got a voice to advocate for changes in the code, changes in the policy. There are groups in the school that you can join to help with these policies. And the only thing that we're doing, we want to let you know, you can get involved in this and you can help support the changes and the, the things for your children. So right now I'm going to pass it on to Dexter and he can tell you some things that we've done to move forward. Thank you, Charlene. Um, this year, Power Pack parents focused on changing the code of the policy school must, that the police must follow. You must, the, that the school must follow. We must follow this code in order to call police when police are intervened in a school incident. But a school incident is not a crime. Uh, let me see if I can break it down a little bit. Uh, telling your teacher no, uh, I really hate to say these things. Telling your teacher no, disrespecting teachers are not a crime. It's a discipline problem, but it's not a crime. Uh, throwing a book across the room, we don't call the police uh, because my child throws a book across the room. That's not a crime. The children are here to learn. That doesn't mean that we, that doesn't mean because we're here to learn that there's not problems. And sometimes the problem you have to listen and get, and then and you have to listen and find out deeper what's going on. Sometimes you, you have to call the police. But right now we, we, we're, we're trying to keep police out of school and most of our problems in schools are not, um, are not for police. Uh, we're gonna talk just a few minutes about my journey, my story, my, my son Jalen. Jalen's a diverse learner. 
um, did have out, well, uh, I, I, I adopted Jaden when Jaden was eight years old. He's 17 now. And Jaden had, um, I didn't know all the problems that Jaden had, all the deep emotion. And when I say problems, when you say problems, you think about um, a behavior, and, and that is, it is behavior. But Jalen had a lot of um, deep emotional things that was going on with him before I even got him. Uh, I adopted him. Uh, he's doing. He's here now. Um, I'm kind of going off script. Jalen is is a bipolar and he have anger issues. But through, uh, see, okay, I'm kind of lucky because of with my Power Pack family, my Kofi family. And I work at the school. I've had the opportunity to, to talk to Michael and talk to a couple of other people at, uh, at, for, for social emotional. I can say that they have helped me tremendously with Jalen. Uh, when they talk about restorative justice, when they talked about there's an, uh, other alternatives about kids in schools, uh, when I've been suspended. See, Jalen is suspended every couple of weeks. Every couple of weeks, Jalen do something and get suspended. He had run out the building. He had. Uh, have tantrums, he'll break down. But through the Office of Social Emotional and being informed of, of my rights of, of, for my child, uh, he's better. He's better now. Uh, in fact, a couple of weeks ago, he, he had a tantrum again, and I was back at the school talking. This time, it wasn't um, about suspension or what we're going to do or we'll kick him out of school. Or what. This time was more restorative. We sit down, we talked about, we built a plan, a plan that makes make sure the school is safe, but most of all, make sure my son is safe. So I had to give my hats off to um, uh, the, the, the and, and, and trust me, I'm not trying to say that it works with every child, but the program do work. Uh, zero suspension, zero tolerance is out, but zero suspension is out, hopefully. But this restorative part, if all hands on deck, that does work, and it worked with Jalen. Um, I think uh, the first time uh, Jen, Jen was, I thought I was arrested. Jen was 12 years old. He was here at the school I'm in now. He was, he was in such an uproar, up the police that was in our school, and that's an elementary school, called the police to take him out. They took him to a place on 39th Street. I never, ever seen this place before. It's a detention center for youth. Yeah. yeah. It's a detention center for youth. I was, I was, they had my child in in, in um, an all police station that is, uh, they took him from school. What, what I'm trying to say is that this start, this start the, 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 the reaction of school to prison pipeline. I mean, I don't know if, I don't, I don't know how to build it. I don't know how, if it was the sale or what, I just know that him and about three other guys under 12 years old was in this facility. Um, when, when his school tells me that the police has been, when they tell him and tell me that the police is being called, there's a whole different reaction towards Jalen. Uh, that's when the performers come in and he's a, he is a performer. So what I'm, what I'm really trying to say is that when children have special needs and special problems and uh, especially with, the, with, with, what's, with what's going on now, our children in a lot of trauma. Jalen is in, in more trauma than others, but the police is not the answer. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. If Jalen's having an outburst or Jalen is tearing down uh, papers in school, when they say he's in trouble, I'm, I'm way on the south side other time. I can't get that there fast enough. And I do say, when they said, we're taking Jalen down to, don't take him to 39th Street. Don't take him there. Take him to the hospital. Take him so he can get, so he can get some help. Uh, he may not like it, but it's better to take your child to, to uh, Stroger Hospital, to uh, Rush Hospital, than to take him to 39th Street. 39th Street is just the beginning of our youth being um, the school prison pipeline. Sometimes parents hear that there are, they're good police officers, and they are. They're great police officers. They just don't need to be in the school. They just don't need to be here. They need to be outside the school, around the school. Our whole community is police. 
when police women go out that door, when police women go out down the street, our babies do not need to be policed in school. I went all off of uh, what I'm supposed to talk about, but the main concern is about getting your child uh, the uh, the proper help when he when when he or she goes through these tantrums. And let's face it, ladies and gentlemen, that a lot of our children, black and brown and white, is in a lot of trauma. But when it comes to the black and brown children, the first thing uh, that they say is, let's take them to jail. The first thing we have a problem, we're not a problem. We have issues, we have problems like, like everybody else. And so we need more restorative practice, uh, thanks to, uh, and the school is at, the school my son is at now is at Al Raby. He's doing a little bit better. Uh, uh, we need more restorative counselors and Lord knows any more mental health issues instead of calling the police for every time something happened. Now, if something happened, if they got a gun or it's drugs or they're selling drugs in school, then we can talk about it. Because a lot of times it's really, it really can't be talked out of it. But that said, um, I'm going to say it one more time. Uh, I'm, I'm lucky, I'm blessed to be uh, to be in a, a power packer, to be a Kofi, because I have the, the tools to fight for my child. And, and, and most of my parents cannot go to uh, CPS and talk to Michael or Ben or anybody else to say, hey, look, this is what's going on. And I did call them. When they was talking about putting Jaden out of school, the, the prince was, was straight out like he got to go. And, and, and no, he don't have to go. Uh, if he's if if Jaden is calling so much problem in school that um, he's disrupting the class constant, yes, then yes, let's look at a therapy to school. He's a wonderful kid. He's a smart kid, and he's mine. And like any parent on this on this uh, at this meeting, you're gonna fight for yours. And uh, I, I once again I want to thank CPS because they fought with me for mine. And I'm gonna turn it over to Land. Thanks, Dexter. Dexter talked about his journey um, with Jalen and Jalen's interaction with the police. I just want us to understand and reiterate that police do not equal safety. If our children are not emotionally safe, physically safe, as far as their building and environment and psychologically safe, they are not safe. They are not safe. Safety is multidimensional. And we want to see our children safe in every facet of their educational experience. Um, the changes to the student code of conduct um, this year gets us closer to our vision of police free schools. We believe that police should only be called to schools during serious emergency situations. Chicago police are not school disciplinarians. They are law enforcement. The changes to the student code of conduct and these updates also expands the protections for students and parents when police are involved. We know we need to continue to bring people into the conversation. We need to change hearts and minds among district administrators, school leaders, and even in our own communities to get more people behind the vision of schools that do not rely on police to discipline our children. Now we're going to ask CPS to provide a summary of the changes to the student, uh, changes students and parents did win this year in police notification policy. And, and we're passing back to Michael to review the, the changes on the code this year. Can you say that again, Aida? 
Oh, yeah, passing back to you, Mike, to review the police notification changes in the code this year. Yeah, so we have made some significant changes this year to our police notification policy. A lot of the folks here from Kofi were instrumental in helping us get to this end result. Um, so in a non-emergency situation, um, and we define emergency pretty clearly, in a non-emergency situation, so before schools involve the police, which includes the school resource officer, if they have one, um, schools must first call the, stu the student safety center to report what's going on and to consult to determine is police notification necessary in this situation. If the student involved in the incident is in fifth grade or lower, the school must consult with the CPS law department before anything can happen. Um, CPS, uh, excuse me, schools must consult with the safety and security office again by calling the safety center to evaluate the situation. Um, look at the students' needs and together determine if CPS has to be notified. Um, number four, and, and I think really important here, is that if the school decides to first to move forward and call the police, and so in that collaborative process, it is determined that a school needs to call the police, um, they first have to make attempts to call parents or guardians, um, including leaving voicemails where possible and trying any number that is on the student's um, emergency form or in the system as an emergency contact. Um, the goal here in a non-emergency situation is to slow our processes down. If it's not an emergency situation and doesn't meet the criteria that was just presented, um, then we don't have an emergency on our hands, right? So we don't need to make an immediate notification to the police department. We have time to slow down, to be thoughtful, to make a determination that the police need to be involved um and to hopefully not have that be our end outcome so these are the factors that we want um, schools and safety and security who has been trained on all of this um, to consider in a non-emergency situation number one is the student's behavior potentially related to their disability as outlined in a 504 or an iep what was the severity of harm to people in the community, including students and CPS staff members? Was anyone physically injured as a result? Um, it's important to note here with this one that if someone was injured, that doesn't necessarily mean automatically that the police will be involved in a situation. It's just something that we're considering. Number four, um, what's the student's age? developmental needs or known trauma history? Is the student's behavior a manifestation of trauma? Is it a trauma response? In many cases, the answer is yes. Um, and police should not be involved in that situation. So once the police are involved, students have several rights and they are outlined in the police notification section in the student code of conduct. Um, number one, um, students have a right to refuse to speak to the police department. Whether a parent or guardian is present, students have a right to not talk. Number two, they can give con refuse to give consent to be searched by the police, which includes their electronic devices. However, this may not stop a search. If police feel they have probable cause to conduct a search, they will do it, and the student can't stop them. But the police ask, can I look through your bags? Um, students have a right to say no. Number three, at any point, students should not be left alone with the police. Uh, number four, students cannot be removed from a classroom or any common areas of the school by a police officer, which again includes an SRO, unless an emergency as defined by this policy exists. And finally, number five, if a student does have an IEP or a 504, a copy of the IEP in 504 must be given to the police so that they know that the student has diverse needs. CPS cannot control how CPD responds to an IEP or a 504, um, but it is our responsibility to make sure that they have it if a student is going into police custody. These rights must be provided to the student if police are en route to talk to them. Um, that is part of the policy. Um, these rights are, are explicitly laid out in the student code of conduct. So if our students are gonna be talking to the police, we wanna make sure that they know what their rights are ahead of time. It's extremely important. So once the police are involved, we do have some rules or guidelines for questioning. 
Um, number one, if the police are going to come talk to a student. So a lot of times this happens where the police will just show up to a building, say, hey, I want to talk to Lynn Morton. You know, we think that she was involved in something down the street. We want to talk to her. Okay. Um, the school must contact the law department first if they say that they want to talk to a student. Um, the law department has to determine if that's going to happen or not. Um, if they say yes, go ahead. The CPS administrators then must make all of those reasonable efforts to ensure that a student's parent or guardian is present during the questioning. That means calling the parents, leaving messages, again, calling every emergency contact to try to get parents that or guardians in the building. If a parent or guardian cannot be present, which we know sometimes may happen, this is law. This is a new Illinois state law um, that we are, are really happy about and, and glad to be able to put into our policy. That by law, a school social worker, psychologist, nurse, or a guidance counselor, or really any school-based mental health professional must be present during that questioning. Um, they are not there to act as an advocate for the student or, or to be a, um, you know, a legal defense, um, but they are there to make sure that the student is being, is calm, um, is being supported in that situation. That staff member cannot be um, someone who was directly involved with the incident that is resulting in the police coming to the building. Um, we want to make sure that they are as unbiased as possible and objective and there to support that student. Um, if CPD requests to speak to a student who may have been a witness to the crime, um, again, it's similar to if they show up by somebody they think has committed a crime, um, they need to get permission from the parents before they can speak to a student um, and they need to contact the law department before contacting parents to allow the interview. The law department may stop the interview before it happens, even if parents say, yeah, go ahead and, let, and, and go ahead and talk to my child, no problem. The law department says, no, it's not going forward. So if the police um, determine to arrest a student at school, um, a school administer, excuse, excuse me, a school administrator or designee is required to accompany the student and arresting officer to the police station or to follow. A lot of times the police won't let you ride along, but you can immediately follow behind. This is similar to the policy we have at CPS with students who are going to the hospital in an ambulance, that if a parent or guardian is unable to accompany a student um, to the hospital themselves to come to the school, um, then somebody from the school must go with them until parents or guardians arrive. Um, so if the parent or guardian can't be present, the principal, can request the arresting officer, the member, member of a school staff accompanying the student. Um, again, the staff member who accompanies or follows cannot be someone who was directly involved. And then the staff member must remain with the student for a reasonable amount of time or until they are no longer needed. Reasonable amount of time being really until the parent or guardians arrive. School administrators and district officials, we really want them to avoid um, student arrests on school grounds whenever possible. So working with the, with the police, if they come to arrest a student saying, hey, kids, is there any way we can do this at dismissal, after dismissal? Is there any way you can go to the student's home to avoid having this being done at school? Depending on who shows up, you might get lucky and they might say, yes, we can um, try a different way. If in the um, unfortunate event that an arrest does happen from school, um, the officer should coordinate with the principal or designee to find a private location that's out of, out of sight and sound of other students to the extent possible. So using a back door, clearing hallways to make sure that the student isn't um, put on public parade in front of all of their peers. We want to minimize the trauma, an already traumatic experience of being arrested from school as much as possible. If a police notification does lead to an arrest, um, it is essential that healing-centered restorative reentry support is implemented upon that student's return to school. Finally, we have added some legal resources for families into the code of conduct. So this is in there. Um, we have added a quit for equality number, which is really there to help support students with um, disabilities. We've got Legal Aid Chicago, Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, 
um, and stand up for each other, Chicago. Um, we've got some awesome, awesome resources, some, some, some folks who are really committed to promoting student rights. Um, we get oftentimes get questions on, on who can I call to help me with something that they feel that was done inappropriately. Um, these are now enshrined in our code of conduct. So we want people to call them if they feel that they need to. We want them to exercise their rights. And I'll say one thing before we before we go to the questions here, is that it's really important that you ask questions and that you know what your rights are. So if you don't know, read the student code of conduct. We have it in English and Spanish, available online and at your school. Um, and if you don't know, feel free to reach out um, to your school or to OSEL to say, I don't know what my rights are here. What's the policy? What is this supposed to look like in this particular situation? We're here to help with that. Um, it's, it's, the policy is its strongest when you know your rights and you know what's in it to hold people accountable. Um, so we are never going to not answer the phone or not call you back um, if you are calling and asking a question. Um, so please make sure that you stay informed. And if you have any questions, big or small, even if you think it's a silly question, those are the ones that we want to hear because we want to make sure that this is explicit for everybody and that you know what your rights and the rights of your student are. Oh, you know, that was, I really enjoyed listening to all of that. And I know some of you all have, some of you all have questions. Some of the things I heard him say was pleasing to me, even though my youngest is 21 now and I've had issues with the police in school. And some of you all might be just starting your journey, getting your children in school. So you might not have come across any problems at all, which is great. When you listen to Dexter's story, there are some parents that have had some horror stories going on that a whole lot worse. You either go to jail or you go to the hospital and get the booty juice. So, if you haven't had it, you still need uh, the student code of conduct book so then you know your rights into anything that might occur so you can be prepared. That's the only thing I can say. Uh, did anybody ever watch Happy Days? Fonzie smoked in the bathroom. The police wasn't called. They was cutting class. They didn't call the police on them. So I know we can do this with ourselves and doing good things for our children. Now, I know you guys have must got a bunch of questions. Anybody got a question? I do. Okay, Miss Valerie. Okay, so when uh, a student has a, stu a, a student that's a diverse learner has an issue, they don't have a Leonze, um to help with that, you know what I mean? Because all police officers don't have that, you know, understanding of a 504 or IEP. So who's there to help that student besides the school? I, I'm just, I, I maybe I missed it. I'm not, I, I'm not understanding that part. So if it's a non-emergency situation um, where we have time to slow it down, we ask the schools to request um, officers who have training so we can make sure that we're, um, you know, if we do have to call 911 for something, that we're making sure that it's a crisis intervention trained officer, that it's somebody who has experienced with schools that's gone through that training. Um, if it's a non emergency, and typically we aren't using 911, so we're making sure we're working with safety and security. Um, because they have inroads with the Chicago Police Department that um, a school doesn't have. So they can make sure that it's the right person coming. So they'll call the school sergeant and get somebody from a school's team, or maybe it's the school sergeant who comes in, who has that really specialized training to work with youth in our schools. That's the, that's the goal of this um, in a non-emergency situation. And let me, let me chime in on that, Valerie. Uh, Michael's right. I actually seen it work. I actually met a couple of police officers when Jalen was having a tantrum. And they, uh, it's a whole different uh, 
the one I met, I met two. The one I met and one that handled Jalen Potter was a, it was a whole different thing. The only thing different about if he didn't have the only thing I would have liked if he didn't have a police uniform on, because you still look at me as being a police. But uh, the way they handled the situation was totally different from before. They want to talk to Jalen. They want to see what was going on with Jalen. They didn't just say, "Hey, let's go." Uh, it was uh, it was different. I want to say I have not experienced and seen it like Dexter have in the new form, but I really like hearing that you at least put it in the book because I've had a child, well, she's still alive. She's bipolar, obstinate defiance and all that other stuff. Police was called. One time she went to jail. One time she went to the hospital. Nobody rolled with her by the time I was able to get to her. I've had people in the school say, oh, we'll take care of it, we're trained, and you wasn't trained. Soon as that first flare up and she went off, Ms. Campbell, can you get here? So the things that I heard him say, I, I, I'm all for it if it really, really works. And, I, and I'm hoping that the words I heard him say, we can put them to the test that he's telling the truth. Any other questions? Yeah, I got one. What happens when your child Hello? I say we can hear you, but because you're outside, maybe hold the microphone up to your mouth so that we don't get the wind, so that we can hear your full question. You're on mute now, um, Mr. Rogers, just so you know. You're on mute, Isaiah. What happens when something happens to your child? They take them to the hospital and you never find out what really happens. Hello? I'm still on mute. No, we heard your no, question. No, we heard it this time. Could you, maybe Isaiah, maybe would help if you describe a little bit more of what that situation was. You know what? Well, I'm on my way to my son's school. So maybe when I get in there, because right now I'm on the street and stopping it, talking it. And too much of okay. good thing for me. We'll come back to you. We'll come back to you at the end of the question once you're inside. Oh, oh what? It, it's something that I have to do to stop that. Who was that trying to ask? Was it Miss Denton or Francine? I think it was Miss Denton. Miss Denton, go ahead, but you're on mute now, so you might have to turn on your uh, microphone on again. Oh, uh, what? Uh, I'm, I'm like I said, okay, this is the problem. What if you're not there and you couldn't make it to the school? And they take your child to the hospital and they can't tell you, you get to the hospital, they can't tell you what happened to your child. So, I mean, they, they should if you're being taken, students being taken to the hospital. Um, but for our purposes with police notification, if a student is being taken, is being taken into custody by the police, we have to give you time to get there. And if that's not possible, then a staff member has to accompany you. But there shouldn't be, there shouldn't be any mystery as to why this is happening. Each time Jaden went to the hospital in the last, uh, he'd been twice in the last year, there was a staff member there. And also the new uh, emotional, I don't know what they call these new officers, but also the officer was there. They both was there. And it took me an hour and a half get to the hospital both of them was there they both explained what happened and we took it from there and and trust me parents i'm not trying to say um that the police is so great and cps is so great i'm just trying to tell you that it's there's there's things that's changing and i see the change 
Yes, I understand. See, I just went through that. That's why I'm asking this question. Because see, I have a disability. I have two disability children. I have both of them diagnosed with ADHD. So I'm, I'm just asking these questions because I want to know. Because could nobody tell me what happened to my child when I got there? anything they should be telling you I, i'm sorry that you had that experience and you can definitely talk to your school's network about it if you need to um but there shouldn't be any mystery as to there's no policy or no rule that says we can't tell parents what's going on with their kid it's it's the opposite of that we want you to be informed we're calling you to let you know that your child is being taken in for whatever reason you should know what that reason is That's one of the great things about being on this, this training, uh, Miss uh, I mean, Zella, because now you can really kind of uh, call one of us or talk to somebody that, or even call downtown to the uh, Board of Education. That's what I would have did if, if, if they had left dead in the by itself and I got there, I would have been raised in total hell. Yeah, and Ms. Jones also has a question, and maybe this will be uh, the last question that we can, Ms. Shelley, Ms. Campbell can move us on. Oh, good. Who's good question? Good morning, Ms. Shaman. How you doing? Good morning. How <laughs> This question, just, your parent just asked a question. That just hit me. She, as a parent, she, as a parent, has a right. She needs to communicate with her principal, whatever a child went through. There's got to be a connection, communication with the principal of that school or the disciplinary of that school. She have a right to know what happened. Know your right as a parent first. She had a right to know what happened. I just wanted to say that because she just hit my heart when she said that. You a parent have a right. I don't care what CPS said, you have a right as a parent at that school. I'm not trying to discipline what the young man just said a few minutes ago, but she has a right to know from that principal. Work with your principal, your parents, work with your principal to know what's going on with your child in the school. That's your right as a parent first. Always know that. As an LSC member, I would definitely tell, keep telling parents that, and as a PTA advocacy for children, you all, know your right as a parent and you stand on that right. That's your child. You should yes. know that. Ms. Jones is absolutely right. I second that. It is your right to know what's going on. And I'm, I'm kind of shocked that, that you didn't get told that because it is standard exactly. practice for you to know. It is your right well, to some, know. She's 100% right. Some of these schools don't let the parent know anything. And that's a policy. And I'm not talking about just one parent, a lot of them. And this is going on and it's not getting addressed. So, so since it's not getting addressed, is not being dealt with by parents are not knowing like you know what's going on with their child can't meet with the teacher never being able to meet with the teacher i don't think that's fair neither you know what are y'all doing what are y'all what is my son progress doing? what is she not progress doing? there's there's no response to that so how do you go about getting a response so i'm putting in the chat here um from our CPS website. So this is something that you can search for on our website as well. Um, this is the Office of Network Support. So these are the, the offices that oversee principals in the schools at the network level. So if something like that's happening and, and, and you first try to talk to the principal and you're not getting a response from the principal or you feel like more needs to be done, look on this list and see what network your school is in and then call that number and talk to the people that oversee that school directly, okay? Because if something like that is happening, they need to know about it so it can be corrected because you should be being informed when things like that are happening with your kids. Just like Ms. Jones said, it's your right as a parent and it is the responsibility of the school to inform you about what's going on. And there are channels for you to go through if that's not happening. And what I put in the chat is one of them. Oh, and Ms. Campbell, you're on mute. Well, 
I hope that, well, one thing I want to put out there, because there's a lot of situations that um, might have a little tweak and things that we ha may have mentioned on this presentation, but you can always contact a power pack person. We got somebody that has been through it, done that, and flipped it and turned upside down in it that will stand with you. I can stand on that. Now, with that being said, we're going to do some scenarios. As they'll know, oh, Lordy. Okay, hold on. I'm trying to read this. Okay, Ty, Ty the fifth grade student, was running down the hall when he tripped over Joe's book bag. Ty fell, but he wasn't injured. Ty was angry. Ty was angry that he tripped and walked over to Joe and shoved him into the wall. Now, Ty was the one running. Joe quickly apologized to Ty, and Ty admitted that he should not have pushed him. So they that that sounds like a uh, uh, what's that? A number two. The security guard observed the situation and escorted Ty to the principal's office. So the AP was very angry and called Joe's parents, who have a history of involving lawyers in situations pertaining to Joe. The parents said they would like to have the school notify the police since their son, they see that their son was a victim of battery. The school decided to call the police and suspended Ty for two days. Once the police came and spoke to Ty, who was not arrested, the AP called Ty's grandmother, who came to pick him up. The assistant principal did not ask Ty what happened, nor was a misconduct report, oh goodness, provided to Ty's grandmother when she came. Oh, I see a whole bunch of stuff up in there. And that's exactly it, Ms. Campbell. Um, we don't have a ton of time, but I think just based on the training, we would love to have uh, maybe one person jump in from what you saw today to point out some of the things that you think went wrong in the situation. Um, for one, the security guard um, passed judgment. Um, the young, the student had already apologized and he had already solved the situation. But the security guard made it worse. Yeah. Was, everything was fine in the first paragraph. Everything was fine. And the second paragraph, the um the school notified Joe's parents, but they didn't have a conference. They didn't the principal didn't try to have a conference with the parents to resolve it to see what had happened. It was an incident. The the, the boys had already solve the problem the security guard made it worse the ap she just added to it mm -hmm. she didn't resolve it she made it worse yeah now to me that ap wasn't on restore to nothing because they should have had a conversation first but there wasn't then you're going to get old poor grandma coming up there. She not knowing what's going on. And then you didn't give her any paperwork. How many times has that happened? And grandma just go ahead and take her child out to school because the school said, and there's a lot of people that the school said, and they believe they right because they don't know their rights. So you know what? When the student code of conduct book, when y'all get one, get two so you can give it to somebody. Because it's a lot of grandparents taking care of kids now too. And from, from the era that they was brought up in, where the school is always right, they know what they are doing. We in a whole new era. They need to know their rights too. 
Anybody got another little, did they see this any differently? So everybody on the same page with what we saw in, in this scenario? Yes. Now, I, I, I want to say, and I don't know if Isaiah finished saying his point, that you guys, we want you to read the book. We want you to know about restorative practice, but we, we want you to be able to discern the situation. If you need help that the school is not providing, you got a lot of resources that were stated. You got a lot of numbers. You got a lot of people. I'm, I'm thinking everybody part of Power Pack because I can't see y'all, so I don't know who all on here. But if you're not a part of Power Pack, I know you know at least one of us. And remember always, parents, you are the best advocate for your child. If something's not right in your school, talk to somebody at your school. Talk to your principals. That's not enough. Go to the network. Call Power Packer. But you have, especially, especially if your child is a diverse learner, fight for your child. You're the best advocate there is, and it will work. I agree, Dexter. I strongly agree. And I just want to add, for people that have diverse learners, just because they graduate out, which you all should be going to these classes about diverse learner and learning about transitioning, even though they get older, they steal your child and they still have some of the same issues. So just because they get 18, it's not like you lose grip and it's over. They steal your DNA. And you never know, some of the people from um, in the school may be able to help you in that transitioning as they get older. Uh, I had to step in again. I'm sorry, but she's absolutely right. Uh, your school uh, get involved, and 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 I say this, and I, and I say this to anybody else. My principal here at at, at Melody has been with Jalen from the time Jalen walked in the door, and I think she's going to be that. They even talk about now where we're going to put. They're coming to me. Where are we going to send Jaden to school at? Where are we going to send Jaden to college at? Get and get get with your school. Get with your principals. Get with uh, and 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 develop a friendship. Develop a network so they can help your child, whether they're a diverse learner or not. But I, I'm I'm blessed and uh, I'm blessed because of Power Pack. I'm ble blessed because of my principals because Jalen has a lot of support. And uh, once again, I can't I can't thank. Uh, Michael, them enough of social emotional uh, down at at, uh, um, at the Board of Education. Uh, it worked. It worked, parents. You just have to open your mouth or type your letters down and start talking to people because people can't help. And that department, I'm not saying all departments at the board work, but social emotional department, it works. So uh, if you have a problem, I know he'll get mad. If you have a problem, send him an email. They will get back to you. I promise you they will. Or call your power pack brothers or sisters. Have a great day. Now I'm gonna pass. Thank you, this Dexter. Question. Thank you, Charlene. <laughs> um, thanks everyone for joining us for being here with us. This uh time that we share today was not meant to give you everything, but it was meant to get you started. Um on your road to understanding the student code of conduct. And as you can see. Take a screenshot, put your phone up there, take a picture of this screen, because um, this is some important information for you to know. Because as um, my fellow Power Packers said, we are our children's first and best advocate. We don't leave it up to chance. We are their first advocate. So if you need more information or you need some help or some clarity, these are some numbers that you need to have. If there were questions <clears throat> in the chat, we will get back to you and get those questions answered and present a one pager with some additional resources. So as you can see over my shoulder, this shoulder, um, <clears throat> what it says, plug into the power of parents. 
we have the power. So plug into the power and join us for Power Pack. Stay connected <clears throat> with your advocacy teams and build that network. So thank you so much and have a wonderful, wonderful day. But before we leave, before we leave, could you do us the favor of everyone turning on your camera so we can get a nice picture of everyone who's here at the workshop? Look, look, Patricia fixed her hair. I seen it. She said, wait a minute. Hold up. Don't snap no pictures. <laughs> Everyone turn on your camera if you would so we can get a picture of everyone that was here. We would really appreciate that. Yeah. Yes, my camera is not it's not showing at the bottom. It only has the mute and participate and check. Oh. Yeah, and normally it doesn't be like that. Oh, Toya. So we just going to No, my name is Latasha. That's my daughter's name. She was using my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, Latasha. We just don't oh, have no. your name on the screen. Okay, yeah, let me let me everyone, let me we're gonna snap it. Hi, we're Mary. gonna snap a picture and I'm gonna count to three and then we have to snap it because we gotta get out of here because parent university needs their link back. Okay. So one, two, three, smile. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank Dexter, Lynn, um, Ms. Campbell, Ada. Thank you so much for coming. I know it's a lot of information, as you all mentioned, but I'm glad um, that everyone's kind of dipping their toes into the subject. Uh, and thank you so much for providing that one pager for the additional questions that there may be. Um, this is very, very important information, and I'm so happy that everyone joined us today to come and um, you know learn a little bit more and, and share their experiences. So thank you so much, everyone everyone for joining our face-to-face -face session. I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of the day. And if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. Take care, everyone. Bye.